Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I'm using Universe Sandbox because people have asked me about civilizations on Super Earths. Would they evolve? Could they be trapped? Well, first of all, we want to talk about what a Super Earth is. And the first Super Earth that was discovered was Gliese 876. 76, yeah. Uh, this is the first one discovered around a main sequence star, I should point out. And unlike many exoplanets that are found these days, this was found just by looking at the central star and watching its spectral lines wobble back and forth as the gravity of this planet pulls it around. So if I click on it, it tells us this thing is 2.76 Jupiter masses and Gliese 876c is 286 Earth masses, which I think is about 75, 85% of the of Jupiter's mass. But the first super earth that was found was right in close. This is a D here and I got to be careful because it's actually getting torn apart or it's leaving a trail of tidal debris. This is seven Earth masses and we know that mass pretty well because we can see the gravitational effects on these other objects. We know the period because of its effects. So therefore we know the mass, we know the uh, distance. What we don't know is how what its radius is because unlike other ones we haven't seen it eclipsing anything. So yeah, transit-based discovery, Koro is one of the missions that did that. It looks for stars passing in front of the sun and, uh, and when it does that you get a little drop in the brightness and so that shows up in, base, in, uh, in the, the brightness versus time and in fact the data from Koro having been analysed by scientists has now been passed to the citizens of EVE Online who, if they're bored and waiting for something to happen, they can fire up Project Discovery and look through data to find these. So yeah, Koro 7, uh, Koro 7 is one of the first ones where they found a super Earth. And again, in this case, they know the radius. They knew that it's about 10,500 kilometers in radius. Based upon the period, they know how close in it must be. So they can estimate that it is pretty darn hot. According to this, the temperature should be about 1250 degrees centigrade because it is so close to its parent star. But there are super Earths and terrestrial planets that are much more sensibly distanted from their parents. Uh, Kepler 62 is a fine example of this. So, Kepler, of course, is the best known planet hunter. It discovered thousands of candidates. Uh, if of about, uh, well in 2011 I believe they announced something like 250 terrestrial planet candidates with 50 of them within the habitable zone. Now in Universe Sandbox you can actually click on the view here and it will show you the habitable zone. This is a K-type star, that's an orange star lighter than the sun so things tend to be closer in but this object here is in the green zone as is 62E. So in the outer zone it needs a little more heat to keep it going, in the inner zone it needs to be kept cool a little. And further in it's simply too hot. So yeah, let's actually take a look at these. We have, this one is 52 moon masses, but that's based on the radius, which is actually about a thousand kilometers larger than the Earth. Kepler 62e is even larger still, but its mass is still below that of the Earth. And the reason is, in both dens estimates, they've actually set the density to be quite low. The density of the Earth is about 5.5 grams per cubic centimetre. In this case, they decided to set the uh, density to be about 2.13. So let's turn this off, actually. So we can lock the radius and then we can tweak the density up to be something more sensible, to more comparable to the Earth. There we go, 5.5 grams per cubic centimetre, and now we've got an object which is actually twice the mass of the Earth. So let's actually zoom in on it here so we can see it orbiting. So the radius, of course, is only slightly larger than that of the Earth. We, we can click here and put it in Earth radii, and you can see, yeah, about 29% larger than the Earth. And what's also interesting to know is that because of the way science works, the gravity is actually 29% higher. 
So as you know, gravity has an inverse square law relationship. As you double the radius, the amount of mass goes up by a factor of eight, but the radius goes up by a factor of two, and that means your inverse square has a factor of four. So it, it has basically a linear relationship. If you keep the density the same and you scale a planet, then its gravity will go linearly with its radius. Same with the low orbit, right? So an orbit close to the surface will be have a linear relationship in terms of the velocity. You'll notice that this thing isn't particularly habitable at this point. We should fix that a little. Let's go into temperature and you'll see that it has no atmosphere. We can fix that. We can give it some atmosphere and let's give it something like, you know, 0.7 Earth atmosphere. Oh, suddenly we get a nice uh, blue surface here. Look at that. 20 degrees centigrade already. We might actually have too much atmosphere, too much greenhouse effect. If, if we tweak this, we could probably make it a little more survivable. But yeah, there's nothing stopping any of these super Earths from evolving life. Some of them may be around flare stars that make things hard. Some of them will pro probably just be the wrong composition, but there will be some subset which will support water on the surface. They will have the right environment. Larger planets may be more tectonically active, but just imagine a civilization evolves around this. Maybe, perhaps, it has a radius which is twice that of the Earth. Well, just think about this. That means its surface gravity is going to be twice as much. Its orbital velocity for low Earth orbit is going to be twice as much. That's going to be like 16 kilometers per second to get into orbit. Could a civilization that evolved on these planets ever slip the bonds, slip the chains of gravity and, uh, you know, have a serious space program? Could they have communication satellites? It would be a major, major project to do this. So it's entirely possible that there are a whole bunch of planet-locked civilizations out there. Of course, that leads to one other thing. Could I build a rocket that could do this in Kerbal Space Program? And of course, I have. So yeah, using realism overhaul, you can build realistic rockets, right? Well, I can then go in and change the radius of Earth to be twice as much. So that means the gravity is twice as much. That means the orbital velocity is twice as much. And this rocket is about seven and a half thousand tons. Um, yeah, and I also kind of messed things up just a little early on because I didn't light the engines correctly. And uh, when you're using realism overhaul, you have to account for the fact that those liquid-fueled engines don't immediately get to 100% thrust. I tried to build something that was kind of derived from the Saturn V. That means the first stage engines are those F1 engines, the second stage are uh, J2 engines, but they're actually the next generation versions. We have the J2X, it's the F1B. I had to use seven F1 engines because although the Saturn V as we know it had enough Delta V to put the command module into orbit around this super Earth. It doesn't have the thrust. A lot of people don't realize that the Saturn V when it lifted off had a thrust to mass ratio of something like 1.2. It lifted off the pad really slowly and most of its losses were actually due to gravity. And that thrust to mass ratio of 1.2 meant that it would go nowhere when you have two Gs of force pulling it down. The ill-fated N1 rocket actually has more thrust than the Saturn V, and it had less mass, but even then it didn't get two Gs of thrust off the pad. So I had to take a whole bunch of shuttle rocket boosters and actually pare them down a bit, reduce the amount of uh, solid fuel on board so that it would have enough thrust just to get this thing going. And as I mentioned, the F-1B isn't the same engine that was pushing the Apollo spacecraft. The F-1 was the original used in the Apollo project. F-1A was supposed to be the next generation, which of course never flew because the whole thing was getting too expensive. But back when they were you know, looking at the design of the SLS, there was a proposal to replace the solid boosters with a liquid fueled boosters which would have two F1 engines on it. So that would be a total of four F1 engines pushing the first stage of the SLS up and that would have 
That would of course in theory give them a more powerful rocket with better fuel efficiency and therefore more payload to orbit, but of course this hasn't gone anywhere at this point. They did actually run tests where they ran the pre-burner and the turbo pumps to see if they could get some idea of how the, how the F1 engines performed. But while NASA did invite proposals for their advanced boosters for the SLS, they uh, stopped the competition and as far as we know it's going to continue using solid rocket boosters probably late into the 2020s at this point. Anyway, like the Saturn V, the next stages are all hydrogen fueled because of course hydrogen gets us that awesome specific impulse and you know we need every advantage we can get. So these are using four J2, or sorry, five J2X engines. Now the J2X is of course the better version of the J2. It's about 30% more thrust. It was developed for the SLS program as uh, the, uh, the hydrogen engine for the upper stage. But of course that again has since kind of fallen by the wayside and been put on hold. Instead they're going to fly with the uh, four RL-10 engines which are pretty wimpy to be honest compared to the J2s. And of course thanks to the magic of uh, video editing you don't actually have to watch that whole thing in real time. I was able to subtly change the speed of things so you could actually just sit and not spend forever just watching this rocket accelerate continuously because that was a very 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 slow thing. Yeah final stage is another J2X with a bit Wow, look at that, over 6 kilometers per second. But look at that, it is actually getting on its way to orbit. It's going to have a little bit of fuel left. This final stage is the Gemini capsule. It's got two uh, Kerbals in it. It's going to have a little uh, hypergolic engine in there. But all this, 7,500 tons just to put a two-crew spacecraft into orbit. And now remember, what is the most popular kind of satellite that we use in everyday lives? It's the communication satellite. And getting a communication satellite into a geostationary orbit when you need twice as much fuel, it just really pushes things out to the extreme limits. And it would need something bigger than a Saturn V to put a communication satellite into a geostationary orbit on a... Uh, super Earth which is twice the radius of the Earth. So yes, it is entirely possible that there are civilizations out there that have evolved an understanding of the universe, they may have evolved technology, but they might be essentially trapped on the surface of their object, of their planet, because the amount of effort it would require to get into space is just ridiculous. Earth is very lucky, we're at this cusp where if we were much lighter, we wouldn't have enough atmosphere to hold or hold on to and the, the Earth wouldn't be habitable. But we're also low enough mass that we can easily, relatively easily, get stuff into space. There's also an argument that the Earth is kind of special because of the collision in its early days, that it might have delivered more iron to the Earth and therefore made the, given the planet, a stronger magnetic field to protect its atmosphere for long enough that civilization could evolve. And of course we are living at a very special time in Earth's history because in about a two billion years or so, most of the water on the Earth will be gone. Of course, in two billion years, it's entirely possible that we don't act, wouldn't actually care about water anymore because we'll all have uploaded our brains to computers and things like that. Or maybe not. Maybe that's not possible. Who knows? I mean, look, we really are reaching into the realms of science fiction here because with the limited understanding we have of these planets, we all we know is that they're passing in front of stars. We get a rough idea of their size. We get, we get to know what distance they're at. But we can't tell what the atmosphere is like. We can't tell whether they've had any of a series of accidents that will make them suitable for life. But the longer we look for signs of life in the galaxy and the less we find it, the more people ask, why don't we see them? And this is, of course, you know, Fermi's paradox. Why don't we see life, more life in the universe, given how, uh, how we can imagine it easily? Some more dramatic people like to talk about the great filter. Whatever takes uh, life and our civilizations and removes them from the cosmic stage. 
And I'll tell you one thing that's going to remove Jebediah and Bill from the cosmic stage is the fact that I've only given them an Earth class heat shield. And getting rid of 16 kilometers per second of uh, velocity, this thing is just not up for it. So unfortunately, yeah, they did get it up there, but they just simply don't have the spacecraft to get back. See, it makes everything harder. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.